Bovril at the ready. Welcome to part two of A to Z of 70s football. Right, we're up to mm -mm -mm, the letter H. Okay, the letter H, sadly, the scourge of society, the hooligan. Yes, I said, I'll tell you what we'll do first. I did a bit of research. Um, I looked at the word hooligan and where it came from, uh, and it said to have originated from an 1899 book called Hooligan Nights, which was a true story uh, about an Irishman who lived in London. But it wasn't like all the other Irish people living in uh, England at that time, because he had two jobs. Yeah, not only was a thief, but he was also a bouncer. So yeah, yeah, he was well above all the rest of his mates, wasn't he? Uh, so that's a little bit of a uh, little bit of an insight as to the word hooligan. So let's wade in, windmilling. It's the start of the seventies. It was uh, it was bother boys, skinheads, Doc Martins, Crombies, scarves and badges, and in the early days, one hundred percent white youths. Uh, fighting basically uh, anybody who didn't support who they did. Uh, and towards the back end of the 70s, there was a clash of not only culture, but of fashion. Yeah, The white dominated skinhead gangs gave way to interracial firms from the larger multicultural cities and towns. And the Doc Martins and the Crombies were replaced by nice trainers. Sports jumpers, your Bringles, and lovely, lovely jackets. Snug as a bug. And, to top it all off, a much, much smarter hairdo. Like, the wedge. <laughs> Nine out of ten lads in the 80s. Walk around like that, flicking the fucking hair all over the place. Uh, the change. Historically, it's been documented... Uh, that some of the British clubs travelling to European games started raiding all the sports shops in Spain, Portugal, Italy, wherever they were going. And that's where all the new clobber came in. Uh, I'm going to do a, a more in-depth analysis of the 80s hooligan in the 80s episode. All right, so, uh, but basically, it started early 60s, late 50s, early 60s. Just angry men, you know what I mean? It happens. Um, and it was it was basically a subculture and a scourge on the establishment. So I remember going Scunny games, mid 70s and certainly Leeds games. And the big deal in them days was something called taking the away end. So, yeah, they'd turn up pretty late, twos and threes, dribs and drabs. And then they'd sort of clock each other and go, yeah, they'd get together in the middle of the home end or the away end that they were visiting and then start yawping their team's chance. And then before you know it, hockey mayhem. And it was the start of the organised groups of fans because prior to that, uh, you had the Red Devils. That was about it. There wasn't organised groups. And before you know it, you had, I'm going to name a few of these, the Herd, Arsenal. County Road Cutters, Everton, the Red Army, Man United, BBC, the Blades Business Crew, Chef United, the notorious ICF of West Ham, one of the first, I believe, to introduce a calling card. Check that out. Check that out. How cool was that? Just when you're giving somebody a good hiding, give me a business card. Another one here, look, another one. Chelsea Headhunters. The Millwall Bushwhackers, Birmingham City Zulu Warriors, Portsmouth 657 crew, named so after the train that got out of Portsmouth to wherever they were playing. You'd army, Spurs, I don't think you're even allowed to say that if you're a fucking Spurs fan now. They called themselves it. And the most feared and notorious of all, and still top of the league, was Leeds United Service Crew. Yeah, 
So there's a few. There's loads. Every team have got a firm. Some people find it embarrassing. Some people, it's a way of life. It is what it is, you know. People who, some of my mates who were like in the 50s and 60s, their kids are taking over the mantle and you can hardly tell your kid not to when that's what you did. Yeah, although maybe give the glue and gas a miss. Yeah, but the rest of it, crack on mate, enjoy yourself. Get a banning order. So yeah, a complete subculture from the mainstream of British society. And like I said, a constant scourge on the hierarchy. They hated it. It was a problem then and it still is now. So that was the letter H. On a lighter note, quick slurp. On a lighter note, the letter I has to stand for, and there's going to be some great pictures here, has to stand for Iconic Kits. You're racking your brains already, aren't you? So I'll put a load of pictures up of these Iconic Kits, because I think the 70s, some of the best kits, and equally some of the fucking absolute worst. So uh, check some of these out. I love this still. This is what Leeds used to run out to when they'd stand in the middle, do a turn and wave at everybody to get the applause. What an admirable, beautiful tracky top setup that is. And the shirt to match, which was stunning. Brilliant. And they even had the, uh, I remember buying in 1978, they used to have um, numbers that they used to tie, a little pendant type thing that had a, a little string on it. They used to tie to hold the socks up. I remember buying them and going down school field. Yeah, I thought I looked brilliant. In hindsight, I looked a complete cock. Um, so check some of these out, okay? Man City. Nice. Crystal Palace. Nice. Birmingham City bit different but yeah I like that I like a bit of that uh, your home internationals check these out the Scotland one was fabulous still love that beautiful England kit yeah yeah it was a good statement piece and I think my favorite out of the home internationals had to be yeah uh, had to be this that is nice the Wales home kit uh, and some of the uh, some of the international teams also, the classic Brazil, beautiful, yeah, understated, phenomenal. But I think two of my favourite international kits from back in the seventies were the uh, the nineteen seventy eight Peru kit. Look at that baby, yeah. See, it looks more intimidating when it's running at you, doesn't it? And even I think it was way ahead of its time little bit sort of um, American MLS or whatever the fuck it's called. It was a little bit uh, a little bit wacky like New York Cosmos Strip. And that was the World Cup kit of Zaire. Yeah, Zaire. Nice bit of kit. So, let's have a look at some of the worst ones. Top of the list, beyond a shadow of a doubt, is... And I don't even like being near it. Check this out. Uh, uh, uh. Coventry City's brown away kit. Fucking, truly, astonishingly awful. Uh, what else have we got? This was only played in four times. Um, because it was deemed and got rid of as uh, superstitiously bad luck. And this was, look, the mid-70s England kit. Fucking bright yellow. Never played in it again. Four times. I think they lost two, drew one, and won one. And it was deemed as unlucky. Lordy, lordy. What else have we got? Uh, Luton Town. Oh, that is just hideous, isn't it? Look at it. Awful. Everything's wrong with that that could be. You couldn't pick a designer and say, come up with the worst shirt possible, apart from Coventry away. 
Yeah, 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 that's bang on, mate. Yeah, yeah. Listen to the remit. Cheers. But I think also one of the worst is this. Carlisle United. It's just shit, isn't it? It looks like a bad jockey or something. So, really, some brilliant, great designs. Uh, and if you're into them, uh, you've got companies like Tops who do uh, some of the retro reproduction tops. But that was a nice little trip down memory lane there. Unless you're a Coventry away fan. Right, let's get on to the letter J. What are you thinking J will be? I'll give you a clue. James, William, Thomas, Hill. Ah, yes. Jimmy Hill. He played 300 games for Fulham. He scored 50 goals. Not that, uh, not that stunning. But the reason I'm, I'm adding Jimmy to the A to Z is because of his revolutionary, way ahead of his time, off-field ideas that helped bring a change to the game. Some for the better, some for the worse. Uh, he campaigned to have the Football League's £20 maximum wage scrapped, which he achieved in January 1961 when his Fulham teammate, Johnny Haynes, became the first £100 a week player. So your inflated prices could be detrimental and blamed on Jimmy, to be honest. So that's one of his downfalls. Uh, some weird facts about him. Whilst he was manager of Coventry, he changed the colour of the kit to sky blue and even co-wrote the club song. He was one of the innovators of the match day programme and pre and half time entertainment. I remember back in the day, the little the little majorettes used to come. All, all the majorettes at Ellen Road there used to be, I don't know, about 50 of them used to come on, banging fucking drums and xylophones. And they were aged generally anywhere between sort of eight and sort of 14. Which was, uh, which was nice that they were getting out, but it wasn't very nice that they put them in front of 20,000 in the cop and singing, Get your tits out for the lads! <laughs> <coughs> Always tickled me, did that one. <laughs> so that was one of Jimmy's ideas. Uh, and he did write a line, a couple of lines in one of the Arsenal songs as well. Uh, he was also instrumental in two other big rule changes in English football. Alrighty. The first was in August 76, when the league agreed to Hill's suggestion to replace goal average with goal difference, with Hill explaining that the goal average over the decades had favoured fewer goals. Fair point, Jimmy. Um, conceded over more goals scored. So, yeah, and they thought, OK. Which he believed should not have been the case. It didn't reward forward play. So, with goal difference, a way to ensure that more goals scored would be more rewarded over fewer goals scored. Fair point, Jimmy. Five years later, August 1981, but implemented in the 70s, the Football League agreed to Jimmy Hill's suggestion of introducing three points, which we still have to this day. Because prior to that, you had two points for a win, one point for a draw. Fuck all for fuck all. So he suggested three points for winning a match instead of two, uh, saying that three points for a win would encourage teams to go win rather than settle for a draw. Fair point, Jimmy. With a win worth three points, what a draw was worth instead of two times what a draw was worth. I know what you was on about there, Jimmy, but you lost me for a second, the old mucker. But I think top of Jimmy's truly groundbreaking achievements all ahead of their time, he was Top Shagger. Oh, yes. Top Shagger was our Jimmy. He married three times. He had a more recognisable chin than Christ the Redeemer, who stands overlooking fucking Rio. He died in 2015, uh, and I'm sure the one true, highly sought-after award, which he would have gladly given all his other accolades up, he never got to be Pipe Smoker of the Year, which was a thing. I don't know whether it still is or not. 
uh, and he would have been in brilliant company. Get this, Pipe Smoker of the Year, 1988. Ian fucking both them. What are you doing, beefy? <laughs> so yeah, that was the letter J. Jimmy Hill. Bless old Jimmy. Quick slurp before we get on to K. It's a good one. It's a good one. Oh. You've got to love Bovril. Kids who don't like Bovril, get a grip. Do you know, I went to uh, Leeds about six seasons ago and they didn't have any Bovril. I said, you fucking what? I said, what, a pie and a Bovril? No, the uh, best thing we can do is no soup. I says, you fucking what? I says, I want to see the manager. And he says, oh, the, uh, the catering manager's not here. I said, no, no, not that fucking manager. I want to see Chilino. <laughs> I said, get him here now. Get some fucking Bob Rule. I've not been for a while, to be honest. Uh, and now I choose to generally stay in the pub across the road, hoping to find another finger. So the letter K is a classic. The letter K stands for cop ends. Ah, oh, yes. The mainstay of every ground. <coughs> Most famous probably is the cop at Liverpool. Famous for their singing in the 60s and the cop's way. This is prior to everything obviously being all seated. Uh, the gelded end at Leeds, as I mentioned earlier, getting up there and just been absolutely mesmerised by everything. Some other famous cops. The halt end at Villa. The old main road, Kipax. Brilliant place, main road was. Not, not a very inviting place to go to, but what a ground. I've been to there, and I've been to the Etihad, and the Etihad is just a fucking soulless bin. Awful. Get back to main road, boys, where you belong. Um, the cram-packed, sardine-esque marvel that was, wait for it, because not a lot of people know this one, and it was, at the time, probably more famous than Liverpool. If you lived in Scunthorpe. The Doncaster Road End, complete with its corrugated iron cafe at the back, which I think cafe is giving it possibly a little bit too much credit. It was a fucking shed with a kettle in. <laughs> the Stretford End. The Clock End at Arsenal. Chelsea's Shed End. And so on and so on and so on. Every ground has won. Some mo more notorious than others. Some famous. Uh, but every ground, every single ground has its own cop in some variation or other. So long, long may the congregation gather at the church and keep your cop ends. Alrighty. Long live the cop. Right, I'm going to go put kettle on and I'll be back in five. Grab a drink. See you in a bit. Three, two, one. Back in the room. We're on the letter L. Now, the letter L has to be Leeds and Liverpool when you're talking about 70s. Uh, there was a composite league drawn up of the Division 1 for the whole decade. Uh, no cups included, purely domestic league. Uh, and Liverpool pit leads by only 42 points over 10 seasons. Uh, Arsenal came third, over 100 points behind. Um, you, you've got to say it was all about Leeds and Liverpool. Yes, you had a little bit of Arsenal at the beginning and latterly you had the emergence uh, of Nottingham Forest. But generally, it was Leeds-Liverpool, Leeds-Liverpool. Led in much by two of the game's most memorable managers in Shankly and Revy. Uh, and as far as the league was concerned, and some of the cup matches, some of the most memorable encounters featured Leeds-Liverpool. Check out this. This is unbelievable. This will never happen again. And it shows the... The appreciation and gamesmanship of characters in the game at that time. 
So Leeds in the 74-75 season went on and won the league at Anfield. Okay. So at the end of the game, the Liverpool players are going off uh, pretty distraught, obviously, because they've lost at home. Leeds were celebrating with their fans. And Billy Bremner looked over to Revy. And I do believe that uh, Don Revy had an inclination that it was OK with Bill Shankly. Uh, but knowing Revy, he probably didn't. And he sent Billy Bremner and all the Leeds players over to the cop. And it went deathly quiet. You can imagine it. Because it was an intimidating arena. And they went over to the cop. And from the absolute silence, which was deafening, the Liverpool fans started singing champions, champions, champions. And applauded all of the Leeds team, which is just... It's like, airs on, even if you're bald, airs on back of your neck are standing up at that. And Bill Shankly afterwards presented the Leeds team with champagne to celebrate in the changing room and said, and I quote, Leeds United are worthy champions. They are a great side. Yeah, and who can forget the 1974 Charity Shield? I watched this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, where, <laughs> where Bremner and Keegan got sent off. They, they, had, they had a bit of a to-do. They had a bit of a to-do and Keegan took his top off. He wasn't happy. No, he wasn't happy because I think he, he realised at that point I'm not going to be a very good player and I should have stayed at Scunny United. Uh, but Leeds that day were led out by none other than Brian Clough. Yeah, part of his 1 and 44 a day. <laughs> And the game was just absolute carnage. If you get on, get on YouTube and watch it, the 74 um, Charity Shield, Leeds Liverpool. And it was the first Charity Shield in history that was settled on penalties, with Liverpool winning 6-5, I think. Uh, God, I only watched it a couple of weeks ago. I think, I think David Harvey missed an absolute, just fucking awful penalty. Yeah, against Clements. Uh, so, yeah, brilliant, brilliant times. Leeds, Liverpool, definitely the two British sides, English sides in the 70s. Head and shoulders above most. Um, and latterly, Shankly was replaced by Bob Paisley. And Don Revy went off to England duty and then went off to sell some camels uh, for a big backhander. Can't fault him, can you? Put your time in. Uh, and he was replaced by Brian Clough uh, for 44 days and Jimmy Alfield. Yeah. So, undoubtedly, the two best English sides of the 70s. Fact. All right. The letter M. Why M? Yeah, the letter M stands for managers. We've just mentioned two of them. And there were some proper memorable characters. It seems, I don't know if, if they'd have had boxes to tick to have to be a manager. Like fucking nutcase. Flamboyant. Gobshite. Whatever. Yeah, tick that, tick that. So I've got a number of managers here and I've tried to sum them up in three words that would just describe perfectly these managers. So we'll kick off. Don Revy, ruthless, obsessive, legend. Bill Shankly, socialist, purist, grafter. Brian Clough, blunt, narcissistic, genius. Malcolm Allison, sheep skin coat. <laughs> Look at him. <laughs> Loads of them in charity shops now. All got Malcolm Allison's name tagged in the back. <laughs> Ali McLeod, deluded, embarrassing buffoon. We're going to win the World Cup. Fucking hell, what was you thinking? Jock Steen. Humble, successful, Freemason. Oh, you didn't know that, did you? Yeah, he was one of them. 
Alf Ramsey, lucky home advantage. Bobby Robson, best English manager. Alrighty, there you go. That was the letter M, but it's in two parts. And I'm, uh, I'm going to tell you about the others as soon as I've gone and grabbed a drink again. I'm, I am bloody parched today. All this chitter chatter, chitter chatter, chitter chatter. Go grab a tab, get yourself a pie, and I'll see you in two. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Part two, the letter M, is a word I don't really like, I'll be honest with you. Maverick. It's a bit American, isn't it? But it was always banded when, when the flair players of the 70s were mavericks. Uh, yeah. Just grace, sublime skills. And in the 70s, there was an abundance of them. There's none hardly nowadays. Uh, and they were the reason you paid your entrance money. Yeah, your admission. That's why you went for that jinking run of Eddie Gray, where he just went round nine players and just scored like nobody was there. You know, when you had some just loads of them. So I've dug deep. Okay, you could nearly do an A to Z of class players from the 70s. But I picked out the most outstanding and I'll try, uh, I'll try and sum them up just with one word for each because we've got, we've got a lot to get through, Mash. All right. So these are my choice of the best of the 70s. All righty. With one word to describe them. George Best. There's a clue in his surname. Best. Fucking bows me to say it, but hey. Rodney March. Magician. Eddie Gray. Wizard. Frank Worthington. Classy. I was watching his goal for Bolton Wanderers versus... Uh, it was either Birmingham or Brighton. Go, go watch it on YouTube. What a goal. Only Frank Worthington could have done that. Johan Cruyff. Genius. Stan Bowles. Entertainer. Jerry Francis. Controlled. Franz Beckenbauer. Kaiser. Johnny Giles. Conductor. Trevor Brookin, masterful. Tony Curry, showman. Oh, he was a class act. I was there when he scored the banana shot free kick. Ooh, classy. Alan Hudson, playmaker. Seriously, I could go on and on. And, and there's got to be something seriously wrong with the modern game where Jack Cheating Bastard Grealish is probably the most skillful player. Something has gone on in the FA to, to crush and stifle any kind of fucking flair that anybody has, seriously. Right, that's pretty much it for part two. When we come back, it will be the letter N. And we're going to kick off with... Nineteen seventies, eight to zero football. <laughs> 